Energy and National Security. James Wilsey has received a total of four presidential appointments, under both Republican and Democratic administrations. Most notably, he was director of the United States Central Intelligence Agency from February 5, 1993 until January 10, 1995. Mr. Wilsey is among the most vocal and, in my view, most credible proponents of renewables, making arguments touching on national security, global climate change, and economics. He is featured in Thomas Friedman's Discovery Channel documentary Addicted to Oil, and in the 2006 documentary film Who Killed the Electric Car? which addresses solutions to oil dependency through the development of electric transportation. I was elated when his assistant responded positively to my request for an interview. Craig Shields, from what I've learned from your talks and writings, you see numerous imperatives to get off fossil fuels, but when we look back on the last several decades, we see a lot of people sitting on their hands. What do you think that is? James Wilsey, well, there are two aspects of energy and security as far as I'm concerned. One is the security of the grid. For us that's not a supply problem. We don't have the European type problem of having some guys who might act up like Putin controlling the fuel for our electricity. We pretty much make our own electricity. But the aged nature of our transmission grid produces several big national security problems including vulnerability of the transformers and other things to terrorist attack, hacking in the SCADA systems, and EMP, electromagnetic pulse. With countries like North Korea and Iran probably getting nuclear weapons and being able to just launch something from 200 miles off the coast, 200 miles up, an EMP could take out a huge share of the grid. So, You've got those grid vulnerability problems for the electricity part of our national energy setup, and then you have vulnerability with respect to oil. You could say that the supply network is potentially vulnerable. If you take out the right buildings in Louisiana, you could really screw up control of the oil pipelines. So generally speaking, you have concern about terrorist attacks. But oil has a whole range of national security problems associated with it that don't really exist for electricity. So, I think there are two big segments of the energy structure, electricity and transportation, that have slightly overlapping but somewhat different types of national security vulnerabilities. CS, yes, yes. As I like to say, I know there are people who don't believe in global climate change. But are there people who don't believe in terrorism? J.W., sure, oh my, you've got a whole bunch of things. You've got, on the pollution front, you may have already seen Boyd and Gray's piece in the Texas Review of Law and Politics about three years ago on the aromatics. Boyd and puts the cost and damage to people's health and medical costs total at approximately $250 billion a year from the aromatics CS, yes, the externalities, quantifying the cost of lung disease and so forth. There was an op-ed in the New York Times just the other day that I thought did a great job with that. JW, right. So you've got damage like this that's unique to oil, which is not really normally thought of as a national security issue. But you've got both the terrorism and enhancing of the bad guys. What Tom Friedman calls filler up with dictators, and all the issues associated with that. CS, let's talk more about empowering the bad guys, especially in so far as we have such a moving target in Al-Qaeda. By the way, you're speaking with a little tax-paying American who really wants to be on the right side of this. But I also represent the people who don't want to be at war unless there's an incredibly compelling case to do so. JW, I don't think the main issue is that we have a larger military because we have to protect oil.
I mean, we weren't in Bosnia about oil. We weren't helping in Kosovo about oil. We weren't trying to feed the Somalis about oil. Yes, it's true that we might have ignored Saddam's conquest of Kuwait. You recall some wag said at the time of Saddam, instead of coming within 100 miles of controlling over half the world's proven reserves of oil, he'd come within 100 miles of controlling over half the world's reserves of broccoli, we would have stayed home. C.S. Right, I do remember that. J.W. So there is a strategic element there, but I don't think that one can go through the armed forces and say that we can do with one or two fewer battle groups if we just didn't have to worry about oil. I'm an old school Jackson Democrat and tend to never see a submarine or an aircraft carrier and not want an extra one. But I don't think that's the issue. I think it's several things mixed together. First of all, oil like gold before it, has the effect that Paul Collier at Oxford and Tom Friedman's site sometimes call the oil curse. Generally it's just that an autocratic state, when it depends for a huge share of its income on a commodity that has a lot of economic rent attached to it, that rent accrues to the central power of the state essentially. So you tend not to have representative institutions like legislatures and you tend to have a much more difficult time getting out of an autocratic structure than with a broad-based economy. If you look at evolution, the examples I usually use are Taiwan and South Korea. They were tough dictatorships, but as they prospered and built up a middle class, and this happened to them a lot faster than it happened in Europe in the medieval and early modern times, it was a similar phenomenon. The middle class builds up, it's diversified, it starts wanting economic liberties and that transmogrifies after a while into political liberties and it tends to gravitate toward freer institutions. That tends not to happen when you've got a lot of economic rent associated with a commodity that you're heavily dependent on. Read Larry Diamond's book if you haven't already. If you look at the 22 countries that count on two-thirds or more of their national income from oil, it's fair to say all 22 of those countries are autocratic kingdoms or dictatorships. And I haven't compared that list with Freedom House's list of the 40 basically. Those at Freedom House called not free. There are about 120 democracies in the world, I mean not perfect, but nonetheless regular elections and another 20 countries like Bahrain that are reasonably well and decently governed, even though not democratically so. And then you've got 40 really bad guys. And I'm pretty sure that list of 22 in Larry Diamond's book is virtually all from the list of 40 bad guys, or not free, in Freedom House's terms. So you've got that effect, which is, like anything in this area, not a clear bright line, but the countries that export a good deal of oil like Canada and Norway that are clear democracies are not in this category of two-thirds of their national income depending on oil. C.S. Right, I'm with you. J.W. So it's really a pretty decisive set of statistics, I think, and then if you look at other numbers, set out in places like Mort Halpern's book The Democracy Advantage, it's pretty clear that basically democracies don't fight each other. They occasionally get really pissed off, but they mainly choose up sides and argue about trade sanctions and stuff. It's not impossible but it's really hard, even going back into the 19th century, but certainly since 1945, finding democracies fighting each other. They just don't. So you've got oil locking some states that depend so heavily on it into autocracy and dictatorship and worse. And those are the folks who also fund the terrorists, who invade neighboring countries, etc. So there's a large national security point here, but that's not the way people often talk about it. We often put it in purely American terms, but I think it's really bigger than that.
It's a big problem for us because we tend to end up being the world's policemen and so forth, but it's a problem for everybody. Now, here's a second point on that. Read Alex Alexiev's cover story in a relatively recent issue of the National Review, and Lawrence writes The Looming Tower. With a little over 1% of the world's Muslims, the Saudis control about 90% of the world's Islamic institutions. Now, given the character of Wahhabi Islam, as contrasted to something much more open and generous, even set aside the radical Shiites in Tehran, and just look at Sunni and Wahhabi. An example I've used on a number of occasions is if you took Ferdinand and Isabella and Torquemada and moved them up into the 21st century, put 25% of the world's oil under Spain, and gave Torquemada $6 billion a year in order to spread the Spanish Inquisition. I've also drawn a parallel between the Stalinists and the Trotskyites. They both wanted to knock off the bourgeoisie and establish a dictatorship of the proletariat. They just disagreed over who should be in charge and whether you ought to be able to go off like Trotsky wanted to and start revolutions wherever you wanted, which is kind of like Al-Qaeda, or whether you stayed with the disciplined structure and obeyed one leader, which is the Wahhabis and the Stalinists. C.S. This is fascinating. Let me ask you this. Looking at the U.S. and the imperatives both domestic and foreign with respect to oil, we look at the last few decades of our history and you might say, well, during the embargoes of the 70s, during the Carter administration that ended in 1980, it looked like we were getting our act together with respect to renewable energy. Starting right at the end of the Carter administration, we turned around and ran 180 degrees the other way. Is this true? J.W., it really was 1985. The Saudis dropped the price of oil down to close to $5 a barrel and all of these ideas, whether they were good ones like biofuels or bad ones like Synfuels Corporation, pretty much all got bankrupted. I think the Saudis were probably mainly going after the Soviets and it did have a devastating effect on the economy of the Soviet Union. I think it had something to do with the system collapsing four years later. But they also basically bankrupted all the efforts to come up with alternatives. And that lasted into the 90s. A little bit of stuff got started in the 90s, but in the late 90s they took it down again. This was probably mainly the Asian recession, but it happened. They took it down to close to $10 a barrel and a lot of the work that was getting going on cellulosic feedstocks for biofuels and stuff like that pretty much stopped. And then, shortly after it came in, the George West Bush administration decided it was going to push hydrogen, which was, I think, a particularly dumb decision. People who wanted to come up with replacements for oil have either gotten trashed once a decade or so by the Saudis, just exactly the way John D. Rockefeller used to trash his competitors, or they've gotten off on crazy tangents. A few actually believed that hydrogen would be a great transition, Though some of that was just Detroit figuring out a way to spend a few million dollars and get a lot of publicity and not get bothered by having to do things like really improving fuel economy or putting out flexible fuel vehicles. So, it's been a mixture of things, but in a way the problem comes down to the fact that petroleum absolutely dominates transportation about 95%-96% around the world, I think and OPEC dominates to the tune of three quarters or more of the world's proven oil reserves. So you can get an argument about peak oil and whether they could still do it or not, but the Saudis, at least in the past, have pulled a John D. Rockefeller a couple of times, inadvertently or purposefully, and that's been a good chunk of the reason that people have gotten discouraged and turned away from it.
There is a certain character to the American people being like Charlie Brown trying to kick the football every fall as Lucy pulls it away from him. C.S. It's impossible to see into the future, but it is possible, especially from your perspective, to analyze the past. Now, when you say, there were probably a few people who sincerely believed in the hydrogen economy and that this was the technology that would take us away from oil, you're implying that there were people who weren't sincere about this at all. J.W., yeah, I think there was a real bait and switch aspect to it. C.S., do you mind expanding on that? J.W., if whenever anybody says, don't you remember the 1970s and don't you remember the oil cutoffs and don't we have a problem with foreign control of oil, and you say yes, but the wonderful solution is the hydrogen economy and hydrogen fuel cells for cars and look at our car here, but don't ask how much it costs. Yeah. It was million dollars, but price will come down and we'll have beautiful glossy print in magazines and we'll say to the world that we are dealing with the problem of oil dependence by going to go to clean hydrogen. I think that was the pitch, and some people believed it, probably, but I think that for quite a few it was just a way to keep looking like you're doing something and it's a lot cheaper to have two million dollars cars and one or two hydrogen stations that you can have pictures taken at, rather than to figure out exactly how in the hell you're going to have a nationwide infrastructure of hydrogen fueling stations for anything less than many hundreds of billions of dollars. C.S. Right. And I'm not trying to be provocative here, but I do want to ask you this. There are some who would say that we elect leaders to act in our interests, not in theirs, and if you have, factually, leaders who were oil men and who knowingly threw out a red herring in the form of hydrogen, thus profiting themselves while subjecting the rest of us to great harm and danger, not only heat-wise, but also security-wise. If it's not treason, it's pretty close. J.W., well, I grew up in Tulsa, which fancied itself in the 50s, and even into the 60s or so, the oil capital of the world. And it was probably true, back in the 20s. The oil business is still there, and pipeline companies and so forth are still a huge part of Oklahoma's economy, and Tulsa's in particular. So I grew up in the middle of this. And the oil business always regarded itself as not understood and not appreciated, but they were the guys who went out there and really drilled and got the stuff that was necessary to run the economy. And they saw themselves, and some of them still do, as being unappreciated, doing the hard and grubby and dirty and important work of fueling the world's transportation and a lot else besides. And that mindset, quite apart from any cynicism, is present in a lot of people who work in the offices. Second there is a lack of willingness to regard the market as being as heavily controlled as it is. I heard a guy from AEI, conservative think tank American Enterprise Institute, the other day at a conference had talked about open standard flexible fuel vehicles, so you could run them on ethanol methanol, any mixture, including gasoline, etc. And he was very much of the view that the government shouldn't be interfering with things by requiring flexible fuel vehicles. Well, in a manufacturing process, the last I heard, they're about $35. There's a $100 oxygen sensor in there that you need. If you really look at what it would cost in the manufacturing process to make these FFVs, it's a different kind of programming in the software and a different kind of plastic in the fuel line. Venture capitalist, Vinod Kosla has made a special study of it, and it's about 35 bucks. So what this guy from the think tank was saying, was it's too much of an interference with the market for the government even to require a $35 part. I mean it's a tiny fraction of what seatbelts cost for example, or airbags. If it was important, 
the market would do it. There are a lot of people who think that way. Now, if you look, it's kind of interesting in the first G.W. Bush administration, they were very much into hydrogen and all this stuff, but Bush himself came around on oil. I don't remember if it was early 06 or early 07 where he went through the business of addicted to oil, and in some of the appointments to the Dow, they got rid of a guy who really was not interested in renewables who was heading up the renewables office. They put in a very good appointee to work on renewables. And they kind of shifted gears a bit in the last couple of years. I think it was just largely a matter of overcoming some of these mindsets about the market and the quasi-heroic role of the oil business. It's a complicated thing. Craig, you didn't ask, but I don't think it had anything to do with Bush's or Cheney's personal interests or anything like that. I don't think that's what happened. I think they were off on these historic tangents. Bush finally started getting interested in electricity, electrifying transportation, but until relatively recently people weren't talking about electricity as a way to get off oil for transportation. They were talking largely about ethanol. And although I think the problems with ethanol are not nearly as severe as the Grocery Manufacturers Association and the oil companies have said, there are some difficulties. It can't be used in pipelines, needs a separate pump, etc. So it wasn't like finding out that your stomach doesn't agree with milk products and just going to the store and switching to soy. You couldn't do that. You needed to go through a number of steps, and I think those several things kept them focused on oil. I guess the final thing is that you really do help on the balance of payments. It's the only thing you help with, by going to more domestic production. If you are borrowing a billion dollars a day, which is about where we are with $70 a barrel oil, if you're borrowing a billion dollars a day for imports, every 365th of your imports that you can produce domestically instead of importing, you save a billion bucks for the balance of trade. So you do that. I mean drill, baby. Drill has something to it. But it doesn't solve the fundamental problem of oil dependence, which is all this business about the foreign dictatorships and the Wahhabis and all that I was talking about earlier. C.S. Right, not to mention global climate change. You mentioned this thing about the $35 part. I could understand that a rapid free market economist, a true libertarian, might say let the market decide. But most people, I think, would probably say, look, as a civilization, there are almost 7 billion of us. If we really wait for true market economics to take hold here, we'll all be dead. JW, oh, I completely agree. I mean I think that's far and away the better argument. I was just trying to put into context the various things that could reasonably be in the minds of somebody who didn't want to have the government take steps to get off oil. I think the government ought to get in there and basically bust the trusts, a Teddy Roosevelt approach. I think that this is what the government ought to be doing. But the two times that the government has made a choice of where to go, it was the Sinfuels Corporation and Hydrogen and neither one of those was very wise, to put it mildly. I mean I think Carter thought he was doing a good thing getting the Sin Fuels Corporation started. Now it of course put a huge amount of carbon into the air and it was extremely expensive, but they weren't thinking about carbon back in the 70s, not many people were anyway and the expense was something they thought would be bearable because oil was always going to be up there at many, many tens of dollars a barrel. C.S. Great. Well this has been fantastic. J.W. Good talking to you. For more information on this contributor, please visit http colon slash slash to greenenergy.com slash
renewable energy facts fantasies slash dot